There's a new article out now. COVID-19 vaccination becoming part of the new normal. I'll put it up here. It's from JAMA. These are by the FDA authors. These are by Peter Marks, Janet Woodcock, Bob Califf, the commissioner, and two other important people, the US FDA high up. And they are talking about the pathway to something that is quite bold, which is an annual COVID-19 vaccination, a new normal, they call it, the new normal. Everyone talks about the new normal. You know, I, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I like the old normal. I like the old normal. Let's talk about the new normal. Let's get into this. They are talking about an annual COVID-19 vaccine, perhaps in combination with the seasonal influenza vaccine. And they have a lengthy essay describing, you know, the state of vaccination in this country, um, the fact that for the majority of Americans, they have EUA authorized three doses. For older Americans, over 50, they've authorized that fourth dose. They are talking about what it's going to take to get to the new normal as they see it, which is a annual sort of fall winter COVID-19 vaccine. The reason they talk about the fall and winter is they acknowledge seasonality in this article. Funny how that works. They are acknowledging the seasonality of the virus. And they are talking about the fact that the mRNA vaccine that we have now uses the sequence of the original Wuhan ancestral strain. And so as the virus has undergone evolution, we no longer are dealing with that exact strain. So should we make a new mRNA vaccine going forward? <clears throat> and they talk about a bunch of interesting things, which is that we need to agree upon what strains, what particular sequences are included in this vaccine, and should the FDA standardize that? And I think they are believers that they ought to standardize that based on the Verbach discussions to date, the advisory committee. Um, they're also talking about how they're going to move that forward and debut that and what kind of regulatory system we'll see around that. But what they don't talk about is what I'm most interested in, which is key and integral to this issue, even the issue of whether or not to standardize it or not, which is how will you know it's the right call? You know, they talk about that if we keep vaccinating every winter, we may decrease healthcare utilization. Um, in some groups, like over the age of 50, we may further reduce hospitalization. We may even improve mortality in those older groups. Maybe that's less likely to occur from 18 to 50, they acknowledge, um, which is, of course, the case because there's a huge risk gradient by age for this virus. But how do you know that the three or four variant strains you're picking are going to be associated with that reduction. And that, to me, is the crux of the issue, because the US FDA, their role is to decide what evidence is, is necessary to prove safety and efficacy. Now, what would I want to see? I think what, I, what we ought to do is in August or September, or even perhaps the, the summer before, by going to the Southern Hemisphere, where they're having winter, we pick what strains we think are most important, and three or four, whatever you want. And actually, you let each company pick whatever strains they think are most important. There's no reason. I mean, I don't believe there's a reason to homogenize that. It's, it's sort of a, a guessing game anyway, just like influenza matching has always been a guessing game. And then you let each company run in the Southern Hemisphere a randomized control trial. <clears throat> you power it for the endpoints that matter, hospitalization, death. You know, if I were the companies, I would target people over the age of 65. Maybe another company says, I want to target, you know, 30 and up, or somebody wants to say, I want to target 50 and up. And they run their randomized trial and they power for hospitalizations and deaths. And of course, the people they enroll, I think, should be people who've already gotten three or four doses because you really want to sort of mimic, I think, the population in the United States, which is already sort of, you know, the majority of people have gotten the two doses are completed the initial vaccine series at this point. Among eligible people, I think it's in the high 70% at this moment. So you want to mirror that in your trial. You can also have some unvaccinated people, sure. Just do have enough sample size so that you can do subgroup analyses in the vaccinated, the boosted, and the unvaccinated. I'm happy to do that. And I think you have to show that you don't just decrease symptomatic COVID-19. You actually decrease healthcare utilization, hospitalizations, bad outcomes. I think it's insufficient to show you decrease visits to a primary care doctor, visits to urgent care. That's sort of a very soft endpoint. I don't think that's sufficient. I think you really need to show those more meaningful endpoints, severe disease, hospitalization, or death. Then, when you get that data, maybe not all the companies will succeed. Maybe... Moderna will pick the three strains that's the better fit and Pfizer will lose or vice versa. You know, let them choose. Let them use the scientists and resources they have to make a guess. And whichever one wins, whichever one can show that endpoint, we will authorize that for the fall with randomized control trial data. But I don't see any of that in this little document here at JAMA. I don't see any of that at all. And I'm very concerned that they're not going to require that at all. I'm concerned that what they're going to set as the regulatory standard is 
We've told you what strains to target. Now you show me you generate antibodies against those strains and we will let you have marketing authorization. And that to me is too low a bar because one, you guessed in the first place in terms of the strains. There's no, um, there, there, there's no tablet that came down from the mountaintop that told you the three strains or four strains that are going to be a problem this winter. You made a guessing game. You could be totally wrong. The second thing is that antibodies is not the metric that ca we care about. We care about hospitalizations, death, and severe disease. So I'm really worried they're going to set that bar low. Why am I worried? They've given me ample reason to be concerned. Their regulatory bar for child vaccination has been antibody titers non-inferior to older age groups, which is a very low regulatory bar. Come on, make them do it. Pfizer's got $100 billion this year. Make them do a randomized trial powered for severe disease or hospitalization. They can afford it. Albert Borla can afford it. He's got all the cash in the world. But the fact that they've set the bar so low there, the fact that they've authorized boosters down to 12-year-olds without making them do randomized controlled trials powered for these outcomes makes me worried that they will also set a very, very low bar. But it's even different than what we have now because at least what we have now is there was initially a randomized controlled trial that was powered appropriately for symptomatic disease that resulted and then we've taken that product and moved it to other age groups and for additional doses but it's the original product here we'll be taking an entirely novel product with a novel sequence and several sequences perhaps and using a very low regulatory hurdle to clear that onto the market we won't know about adverse events i mean myocarditis is a salient concern particularly in men between you know 12 and 40 or the highest eight risk group 16 24 what will happen when you permute the spike protein sequence in that vaccine and give it again and again what will happen to myocarditis what there it may be one sequence is more likely to have it happen than another i don't know we, ha we have a very little mechanistic understanding of why myocarditis occurs we don't know so if you're not doing big randomized controlled trials, you're doing some small thousand person study for antibody titers, you won't even know what you don't know. You won't know that there's a safety signal that could be even twice as high, three times as high as the original vaccine sequence. Maybe it's lower though, maybe it's better. You don't know that either, you know? How will you know that there's a net benefit to this or not? Unless you do the randomized trials that I'm talking about, you will not know. One more piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> Many years ago, Jeff Bien, who's a, fellow now at Stanford University and I, we did an analysis for the British Medical Journal. Well, it was published in the British Medical Journal. And it looked at where FDA reviewers go when they leave the FDA. And we followed these people on LinkedIn. And we found that roughly when they leave the FDA, one in two of them go to work for or consult for the biopharmaceutical industry. These are medical reviewers. Why do I mention that? I mentioned that because you've got to start to worry about capture going on at the agency. The job of Peter Marks and others at the agency is to set the bar that improves public health, what's best for people. It's not to set the bar that improves Albert Borla's profit margin. And I really worry that if you don't compel these manufacturers to do these randomized control trials that measure the endpoints that we care about, you will be helping Borla but not people. And maybe that happens because of the cozy relationship between the FDA and the industry and that revolving door, which is the deep corruption of the system. And it's not just FDA, of course, it's SEC. It's all these agencies where people just revolve in that revolving door and the public is let down by bad regulation. And it leads to people thinking that, you know, all government is bad. Whereas I think the problem is that these are core structural biases in government that could be fixed and government could actually work for us. But that's my bias. Maybe I'm still an optimist at heart. My point's here. COVID-19 vaccination becoming part of the new normal? Prove it to me. Prove it to me. You persuade me that this actually improves clinical outcomes and you will have my full-throated support. You persuade me of that. You do these randomized studies. You show reduction in hospitalization. I'll be out there saying that's a great thing. Just as I was out there saying that the initial vaccine was incredibly remarkable. And I said that many, many times. I keep saying that. Um, but... But if you show me data like you showed me for boosting 12-year-olds or show me data like non-inferior antibody titers and you don't show me that these three sequences you picked are, 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 are even going to be what we deal with, I'm not going to be persuaded. And I don't want to fork over billions and tens of billions to Albert Borla and Pfizer without the proof, the proof that it makes people better off. The FDA is the only agency in this country, the only agency that has the ability to demand the manufacturer generate this data. If they fail, they will be failing every single American who is subject to these. And of course, you know the moment they EUA authorize this or whatever they or whatever regulatory path they pursue, if they don't generate that credible data, there are going to be mandates and people being pushed out of work or marginalized, et cetera, et cetera, creating all this sort of social cost when you don't even know unless you do the studies I talk about, you will not know that you're actually going to have an improvement in outcomes. That will be a problem. So 
Those are my thoughts. The new normal, you know, I want the old normal. The old normal where we actually prove things. We have hypotheses and we prove them with science. We don't just do things that benefit companies. I like the old normal where, you know, uh, uh, where a lot of things, I mean, you know, where we hug people and live normal lives, which is really what we ought to be doing after you've been vaccinated and or boosted for the, the group of people who probably do benefit from boosting, which is older people. Anyway, those are my thoughts here. We got to be real careful. It's a very delicate time in regulatory science. There are a lot of people who study regulatory science. They're up in arms about aducanumab. They're up in arms about Exondis. They're up in arms about cancer drug policy. You need to get into this debate. You can't fight your debates about evidence in your little esoteric field that nobody really cares about and miss the biggest, biggest debate in regulatory science in this year, which will be before we launch a yearly mass vaccination campaign of a virus that's evolving around us that we've already inoculated ourselves against at least once, twice, maybe three times. What evidence do we need for that? That's the biggest battle, and that will have spillover effects into all sorts of different regulatory questions. You need to enter this debate. Get off the bleachers. Stop worrying about your tenure job. Get off the bleachers and start talking about this issue. We need you here. Forget about these rare disease drugs where you want to make a point that, you know, 10 people, 15 people care about. Get into this debate, okay? Those are my thoughts. If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.